So good evening, everybody. On behalf of the whole NAOS team, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you coming from different countries and different continents. We would like you to be part of a new page we are writing for aging science and age management strategies, the page of the Proteome. In this mission, we are not alone. Professor Hanman has spent most of its, uh, what, 40 plus years of uh, studies mm -hmm. trying to unravel the secret of longevity. So welcome again and uh, let's get started. So Professor Radman, when it comes to aging science, we've learned to focus on DNA and proteome was never mentioned. How come and what led you to look into it? This is presumably because of the uh, history of molecular biology, where the genes are set like gods, you know, uh, as the most important thing. Then comes RNA, then comes proteins. At the, now. So genes were like, you know, big boss, you know, smoking cigar, whereas proteins were workers. And nobody paid attention to what the workers were doing. But when the test came with uh, bacteria first and then with animals that are incredibly resistant to damage by radiation, uh, re resistant to time and so on, then the truth came, and that is that the, in this bacterium called Dinococcus radiodurans, means it withstands radiation, we found that the proteins were protected, not genes. Genes are important, but only as an instruction to make proteins. What we can also keep as a take-home message is that when the genome is damaged, it is a proteome that repairs it. Hence, our conviction that proteome is more important than the genome. Life would not last and evolve, especially. You need a memory of past experiences in order to evolve uh, life. It, it would not evolve. Life would not be perpetuated without genes. But life, at any given moment, life is proteins. They do everything. And that's why the direct effect on those who are actors of life, the proteins, is, is the most direct way to handicap life, including aging, including cell death. And it gives us now a, a hope that there's a simple way of protecting life. Just concentrate on protecting proteins. Every, they will take care of every, everything else, in a way. Okay. Looks like a politic speech, you know? Yes. <laughs> Political speech, like it's, taking care of DNA is the boss, but the most important is people yes. around. People. So. Uh -huh. yeah, yes, yes. Yes, please vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? I have a question for you, Professor Radman. Uh, actually, of course, proteome topic is so important, but which other evidence do you have about proteome protection in aging management process? Uh, thank you for, for the question. Uh, it, this aging management hasn't yet started, certainly with this point of view and with this kind of technology, S started on people. But the principles of life, the way the li life is run, is amazingly similar from bacteria to humans and to elephants. And, uh, uh, and therefore, when one goes at the fundamental level of DNA, proteins, RNA, uh, it's practically the same, the same principle uh, are that are therefore a life of a, sing, of a simple bacterium um, are there for men. So what we learn from uh, these simple organisms, it's much easier to do experiment with bacteria and yeast than with people. So it is the, with, with this particular aspect, which is 
how and why organisms age and, and what is behind this Gompers law of exponential increase in diseases and death. Why don't we live, you know, 87 years and then die all at 87 years? No. It, is, it is because of the, of the, the diversity of life and, and on life forms. There is something that lasts four billion years. Would you call it, for practical reason, immortal? four billion years. I would call it for practical reason immortal. But it is not an organism, a thing. It is a process, it is life. Life lives, the process lives four billion years. So life is quasi immortal. I think that the marvel of life is, is, is such and the, the process is so successful that it is immortal, the process. But the products of that process are not immortal. Can I ask uh, how you think that uh, the mechanism of uh, proton protection that you are studying in the bacteria uh, could be uh, applied to other organisms, uh, such human beings in the future? In fact, our genome, the useful part of it, is not that much bigger than of a bacterium. Uh, and, uh, E. coli about 4,000 genes, we have 21,000 genes. Uh, the small microscopic worm has 20,000 genes. Um, octopus has 33,000 genes, more than 30% uh, more than we do. Uh, and yeah, and so the most of our genome being so big is actually a cemetery of dead Parasites. What is clear and simple, Miro, is what you can observe. And when it comes to all age-related diseases, what can be observed is that the common point to all age-related diseases is damage to the proteome. You take Parkinson, Alzheimer, diabetes type 2, Huntington, everything, you can correlate the severity of the disease with the content of damaged aggregated proteins. So, Isabel, what exactly makes this protein invincible? I mean, what is the mechanism involved that the traditional uh, antioxidant can't uh, provide? Actually, it's very simple. Uh, we see that proton damage is induced to the protein okay. by the free radicals. The most efficient way of protecting the proteins to make them invisible would be at the same time to protect the protein, mm -hmm. and to scavenge the free radicals. Antioxidants scavenge the free radicals, but they don't protect the protein. Here we have a chaperone-like antioxidant that covers the protein, reduces the sensitivity to the attack, plus neutralization of the free radicals. Therefore, it's a two-pronged mechanism of action that supersedes traditional antioxidants. What impact can this discovery have on the way we approach health in general. There was no design to produce these chemical chaperone, antioxidant chemical chaperones by bacteria for the benefit of some other species. It produces for the benefit of itself. And that such molecules arose by evolution, by selection, means there was a need for it in bacteria, right? Now, it is in, 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 in life, in our, especially human life, it is, it is normal to steal the products of evolution from other species uh, and, and, and use it. You know, we make teas from different plants and so on. So uh, these properties of, of these molecules evolved in bacteria and being useful to bacteria to withstand all kind of natural stresses, right? Now, uh, on the same principles can be used to protect our own proteins. And especially those, the chaperones go to abnormal proteins. So uh, abnormal proteins are hypersensitive to oxidative damage. So it's as if it was designed to our, to, to, to our wishes that the proteins that are 
most fragile are those that predispose to disease. And therefore, using these products of natural evolution and <clears throat> translating from one species to another is, is both legitimate and it is uh, uh, justified uh, scientifically. Because before we show that indeed human proteins and, uh, and animal proteins and so on are equally protected by these uh, chaperones, chemical chaperones evolved or developed in bacteria. As we saw that um, carbonylated protein aggregates are the hallmark of all age-related disease, with this same mechanism inspired from bacteria, we can prevent all age-related disease, such as Alzheimer or uh, So that's a great thing, because when we were talking earlier, a lot of medicine is about dealing with the effects of mm -hmm. the damage. So, and, and let's face it, pharmaceuticals are about, they're not about preventing disease, they're about, okay, here's the problem, let's, let's figure out something to fix it. Where, where this is, if you look at how we can affect health going forward, it's really preventative. Here we are not only talking about preventing the disease, rather than protecting and preser preserving the health. Right. And this is what we try to do with protein protection, health maintenance, actually. And that's similar to cholesterol or, you know, sugar. It's, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. And Isabel, we know that the implement of the scientific discoveries to the field of the medicine takes long time. And how could we benefit this discovery faster? Well, actually, the most difficult has been done. We know what we need to do to protect the proteome. We know how we should protect it, chaperone and antioxidants. And we have a hint where we should find the answer, extremophile organisms. Therefore, it won't be so difficult and it won't be so time consuming to extract the um, protective system of extremophile organism and to apply it for the skin. Can you define what an extremophile organism bacteria is? Like, what, what are the attributes that make that definition? It's a kind of longevity hero. It's an organism able to sustain stresses that should kill any form of human life. So depending on the extremophile, it can be high level of radiation and or oxidative stress and or temperature, either heat or cold, and or desiccation. All these environmental conditions that should kill life do not kill uh, extremophile organism. And even better, they have managed to uh, transform this hostile environment into an optimal one. Therefore, they are considered as examples of evolutionary perfection. And I want to know, how can I uh, uh, know that the organism is compatible with the human skin? Actually, it's not the organism which is compatible. It is what the organism produces to self-protect, to protect its proteome. So what we take, we extract from the bacteria the bacterial ruberin that it synthesizes to protect its own proteome. And this, of course, we conduct tolerance tests, safety tests, to make sure that it is compatible with the skin. So we went through the whole chain of toxicity testing to make sure that what is produced by the bacteria is suitable for skin application. Okay, thank you. I would like to know if this technology mm -hmm. of the chaperone molecule are also targeting the extracellular protein of the derm, such as collagen and elastin. It's a very good question because we all know that the base of the aging, the source of the aging, lies at the level of the dermis. So we conducted experiments to make sure that we have good penetration of this active, new active uh, ingredient. Mm -hmm. We conducted uh, front cells plus ex vivo measurement. Ex vivo means that we took skin explant, we applied the uh, active ingredient on top, and we measure its penetration and its ability to protect the protein through its penetration. So we measured reduced level of epidermis protein carbonylation and, your question, reduced level of elastin carbonylation and collagen carbonylation. So yes, um, this active ingredient can protect the extracellular matrix of the dermis. Wow, incredible. <laughs> no, really? It's incredible. <laughs> So if I understand this extremophile bacteria, instead of repairing the aging effect, 
is in fact struggling against uh, the aging process, but at the very source. Exactly, because it uh, is efficient ahead of the aging process, it has an effect at the same time on all age signs. And we have demonstrated that this extract of snow bacteria, because the extremophile organism we um, uh, studied was uh, snow bacteria, we have demonstrated this efficacy on all age signs with one single comprehensive approach. Mm -hmm. So, Isabel, uh, you talked about a bacteria found in a snowflake. It's different from the one studied by Professor Radman, is it? Wait, what are, what's the difference between the two? Actually, to select which bacteria we wanted to uh, develop, uh, we submitted them to a kind of challenge. So we took various uh, bacteria from extremophile bacteria, but from various environments, including the snow bacteria. We first um, irradiated them with UVC. Only the surviving ones, we checked the antioxidant power because coming from the industry, we all know that um, the fight against oxidative stress is very important. And we selected the one that ranked best on both items, resistance to UVC and antioxidant power. And this is how snow bacteria won. How can be the bacteria use it to improve the texturing the skin cells? Well, the good news is that uh, now Saging Science has extracted these bacterial ribarines from um, snow bacteria, and uh, we formulated them into a serum that uh, will soon be proposed by Institut Estedam. So it's uh, good news for uh, each of us, I believe, because uh, <laughs> yes. we have the hope to improve the longevity of the cells by protecting its proteome. We are talking about skin youthfulness, but of course, maybe in time, in the future, we can take it as a systemic protector of proteome because there are many uh, diseases, skin diseases, like atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, skin cancers, but the other uh, diseases, cancers, and the neurodegenerative diseases, uh, I feel that we are in a beginning of a new era because uh, this maybe we can, uh, we are now starting as a topical product, but in time uh, it will develop and we can have a systemic treatment for the many diseases. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much because it's also our hope. Yes, I hope too.